How America is Becoming Unraveled is the title of my piece over at HartmanReport.com. And I start out with David Brooks. He's, he's, he has a column titled, America is Falling Apart at the Seams. Uh, David Brooks has been a, you know, a relatively conservative columnist for, geez, decades. I've been reading his stuff. And, you know, occasionally he writes something that I think, you know, whoa, that's really thoughtful. Um, you know, sometimes he, he's, he's just, you know, shilling for the Republicans, but whatever. But he's quoting, actually, from Matt Iglesias' uh, Substack newsletter, Slow Boring, uh, where Iglesias is pointing out that you're seeing now more killings in America, more murders, which is a subset of the increase in shootings, which in turn is a subset of the large increase in gun carrying. But traffic deaths are also up. Unruly passenger incidents on airplanes have surged. Schools are reporting more discipline and student safety issues. He says, basically, the murders seem like the tip of an iceberg of bad behavior. And Brooks, David Brooks, uh, says, uh, as a columnist, I'm supposed to have some answers, but I just don't right now. I just know the situation is dire, which is how he wrapped up his piece in the New York Times. And so, you know, I, I read that and thought, this is not a mystery, what happened here. And, you know, let me just lay it out for you. I, you know, what we are seeing... Yeah, by the way, progressives have been warning about this, this concentrated right-wing power, uh, racism, the wealth, and corporate power. Uh, progressives have been warning about this since 1901 when Teddy Roosevelt became president after, you know, uh, McKinley was assassinated. So here's a, here's a quick kind of bullet point summary of how we got from where we were to where we are and why everything is coming unraveled. Prior to World War II, there were two Americas. There was one for white people and one for everybody else, and they were strictly separated by a Supreme Court decision in 1896, plus E.V. Ferguson. Then Harry Truman, on July 26, 1948, issued an executive order, Executive Order 9981, which integrated the military. And then a couple of years later, Dwight Eisenhower put Republican Earl Warren on the on the Supreme Court. In fact, he made him Chief Justice from nothing to Chief Justice. In fact, Earl Warren ran against Eisenhower in the 1952 election for president. But anyhow, he, he put him on the Supreme Court in October of 53, and the next year, Warren organized a unanimous decision to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson uh, in in Brown v. Board, saying that schools can no longer be segregated. And that ruling. I think if you're looking at a, at a beginning point when a bunch of cynical politicians and right-wing crazies really jumped into things, that ruling was it. This produced this right-wing political explosion and what they referred to as a massive resistance campaign where schools, entire counties, entire, you know, large chunks of states shut down their public schools rather than integrate them racially. And then all-white churches stepped into the breach, and those all-white churches started organizing all-white private schools, which then became a source of money and political power for this racist white evangelical movement led by people like Jerry Falwell, who back in 1958 said, and I quote, The true Negro does not want integration. He realizes his potential is far better among his own race. It will re destroy our race eventually. And, and then goes on to tell the story about, oh my God, there's a neighbor who who's, has a mixed race couple. This Brown v. Board ruling in 54 also put the John Birch Society on steroids as wealthy right-wingers like Fred Koch helped fund impeach Earl Warren billboards and advertisements all across the nation. In the U.S. Senate, uh, George's Richard Russell, who I wrote about yesterday, Senator Russell, organized a Southern Manifesto signed by 19 senators and 77 House members saying, quote, this unwarranted exercise of power by the court is destroying the amicable relations between the white and Negro races and has planted hatred and suspicion where there has heretofore been friendship and understanding. Right. Everything was so wonderful before Brown v. Board, right? Enough Americans were horrified by this naked racism that Jerry Falwell and, and Richard Russell and Fred Koch and all these other guys were just, you know, openly expressing that on June 11th, 1963, President John F. Kennedy proposed civil rights and voting rights legislation. Now, he was assassinated five, five or six months later in, in uh, November of 63. But after he was murdered, President Lyndon Johnson said, we have to pass this to carry on John Kennedy's le legacy. And those two laws 
were passed in 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act over the strong objections of so-called conservatives in both parties. Nixon then becomes president in 68 after committing treason by cutting a deal with corrupt officials in South Vietnam to blow up the peace deal that LBJ had negotiated. Uh, he also, in order to get enough votes to win, created this thing called the Southern Strategy, which was the Republican Party now openly reaching out to Southern Democrats who were white racists. Then Nixon put Lewis Powell in 1972 on the Supreme Court and thus began the hard right tilt of the Supreme Court. Lewis Powell, the guy who wrote the Powell memo about how to overthrow a government. And they started striking down union rights, uh, struck down hundreds of state and federal good government laws so that they could legalize political bribery, which they did in 1976 with the Buckley versus Vallejo decision when billionaires owned politicians. Before that, it was called bribery. And after that, it was called free speech. And then two years later, Powell himself authored his, a decision, First National Bank versus Bilotti, saying that corporations have that right, too, to own politicians. And then, you know, by 1980, the libertarian movement had largely eaten the Republican Party alive. This was, uh, you know, they were all embracing Ayn Rand's gospel of selfishness. They turned it into a political creed. You recall Paul Ryan required everybody on his staff to read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, that year, Ronald Reagan's campaign followed Nixon's, this is 1980, followed Nixon's treasonous example of cutting deals with foreign countries to destroy Democratic presidents. He cut a deal with the Iranians to hold the U.S. hostages until after he'd beaten Jimmy Carter in the election. The Iranians released the hostages literally to the minute as Reagan put his hand on the Bible. A flood of big money then flowed into the Reagan White House, and in return, St. Ronnie cut his benefactor's top tax rate from 74% down to 25% tripling the national debt and exploding inequality in this country. Reagan then began a propaganda campaign to convince Americans that our government is not the solution to our problems, it is the problem. American government is evil. And thus Americans began to lose faith in Americanism. And this is when the slide to today's crisis that David Brooks writes about really began in earnest. In the 80s, we got Limbaugh and the whole right-wing talk radio thing. They came of age with a modernized 1980s version of Nixon's 1960s Southern strategy uh, with things like, uh, you know, uh, brown people are going to take your job, the Hillary Clinton nutcracker, and affirmative action rants and reparations rants and critical race theory rants, all this stuff basically to crank up the right, the, the white racist base. Of, the, of what now was the Republican Party, it used to be the base of the Democratic Party in the South anyway, pre-65. Then in, in, in the, also in the 1980s, scientists began warning about the dangers of climate change. And so Republicans and the Limbaugh crowd and their fossil fuel billionaire funders launched a campaign asserting that scientists are just hustlers. They're on the take. You can't trust them. Science is the enemy. And suddenly it got real expensive to go to college. Remember that in the 80s? And student debt got exploded and, and Reagan used to talk about college educated pointy headed liberals and elite professors. Unions collapsed throughout the 80s and 90s. And so Bill Clinton and Al Fromm created the DLC to build a financial arm between clean industries like banking, insurance and pharma with new Democrat politicians. And then, you know, he took the, the free trade deals, NAFTA and the WTO, that Reagan had negotiated and signed them. And bang, off go our jobs. 60,000 factories have now moved overseas since that happened. And then, you know, the NRA said, hey, let's, or the weapons industry said, let's get in on this. And they started pouring money into the National Rifle Association. And suddenly we've got and, and bringing gun rights cases before the Supreme Court, and now we've got more guns than people in the United States. We're the only country in the world with that problem, developed country. George W. Bush continues the deregulation and the, and the tax cut scam and begins privatizing Medicare. It's about half done now with the so-called Medicare Advantage scam. Then we elected a black man president, and the right wing went nuts when Barack Obama became president in 2008, which led us right to the, the right wing Tea Party and the birther movement, which was being led by Donald Trump back in 2008. 
and right-wing media exploded in both popularity and profits. I'll pick up the rant on the other side of the break. This is, you know, a, a, a quick history of, of America's decline. Stick around.